The next stop on our journey to being great statisticians is uh, something we refer to as dependent samples. I'm going to introduce the, rudi the, the, the most rudimentary design uh, of experiments um, and the subsequent analysis we test we use, the statistic we use, called the dependent samples t-test. So, um, dependent samples are when measurements are related to one another systematically. Um, the measurements came from the same subject. We call these within subjects designs or subjects were paired or matched. Uh, we sometimes refer to these as matched pair designs or paired uh, paired t uh, tests and, and so on and so forth. Now, um, these are also known as repeated measures designs. So let me speak to this a little bit. Why would we ever want to do this sort of design? This sounds sort of funny, but this is a classic design. So if you uh, test somebody, um, give them some sort of treatment or condition or exposure to something, and then test them again on the same measure to see if they've improved, that's sometimes referred to as a pre-post-test design. That, that is a dependent sample design. In psychology, there are famous uh, dependent samples designs we call twin studies. That is, that when we have twins, and one twin gets one condition, and the other twin gets another condition, and we have sets of twins in which we test this way, that's a matched or paired design. The twins go together, so to speak. Um, so, dependent sample designs are, are, are used widely in, um, in psychology and in... Uh, uh, all sorts of science. Why do we use dependent samples? Well, the first thing is, is that there are uh, some really, really big advantages. Number one is, uh, if you do a within subjects design, you need fewer subjects, you need fewer participants, you need fewer people to participate in your experiment. If you measure them uh, both before and after a condition, for example, then you only need half of them. You don't, you don't need uh, uh, two independent groups you can get one group uh, that's dependent, but um, have two measures. And the big whopper is that you increase power. Now, I'm going to be talking about power um, soon, but uh, let's just say that this is an enormous, enormous advantage. Um, and it is my contention that if you are going to do an experiment, if you're going to set out to design some research, think about how you can do this in a dependent sample manner. Dependent samples are not only intuitive, I think, they are also extremely, extremely powerful, much more powerful than independent group uh, designs. If you can design your experiment in which it's within subjects or repeated measures, you definitely want to do it. Now, the disadvantages of dependent samples are carryover effects. What's a carryover effect? Well, let's say that you're interested in methods to teach reading to preschoolers. We introduce the whole language method, and we measure how well they read, and then we introduce the phonics method, method and measure how well they read. We have a repeated measures or within subjects design. But how can we remove the effects of teaching reading with the whole language method? I mean, we've, we've taught them how to read a little bit. How, is, how do we expect to, uh, we don't expect that they forgot how to read, right? There's a carryover from one condition to another. Now, this is common in drug studies, too, where you might give, might give a person a drug and test the effects on it and then give them another drug and test the, the effects. How do we know the drug is completely out of their system? That's a carryover effect. So we have to be concerned about this. Now, we can eliminate carryover effects by matching using matched pairs designs, but... Uh, matching is a little bit subtle. You got to make sure that you do matching well without respect to the obtained scores. You have to do it before the experiment and you lose the advantage of having fewer subjects. Now you need uh, you know, the same number of subjects you would need if you were doing an independent sample design. You still gain the power for matching but um, you, you're going to have to recruit that many more people. Matching has to also be done along a dimension that is relevant to the study. Otherwise, it's not going to it's not going to be meaningful. You'll talk much more about these sorts of designs when you get to research methods. So this is sort of an introduction, though. A dependent sample t-test is the preferred uh, mode of uh, operation here, right? Um, that's why I'm introducing it. And what we're going to be doing, it turns out that 
the uh, if we take the difference between pairs of scores, either the result of matching or taking multiple measurements from the same subject, it turns out that the difference in scores divided by the standard error of the differences is distributed in a very systematic fashion. It turns out it's distributed as a T statistic. Once again, our friendly T distribution comes to our aid in this case. So this is a very easy test to do. All we have to do is calculate the mean difference, the standard error, and then the T. This is the formula for that. This is the, the uh, mean difference. This is the standard error of the differences. This is our hypothesized difference, our, our hypothesized mean difference. This is delta. This is a population parameter. Delta sub null here is what we're, we're considering it. And this, most of the time, this is going to be zero. So this term just drops right out. The standard error of the differences is just the standard deviation of the differences divided by the number of pairs of scores. Okay, so this describes what those terms are. I've just uh, described them. Um, so let's go through an example. We want to compare a new teaching method with an, a traditional method. We collect two groups of uh, 10 12th graders. One receives the old, one receives the new, and we match them on the basis of their IQ. What that means is we take the two kids with the highest IQ, and one of them we assign to group old, one of them we assign to group new. Then we take the next two kids with the highest IQs. One of them gets randomly assigned to one group, one of them to the other, and so on and so forth. And we do this with all ten pairs, so the highest, the next highest, the third highest, the fourth highest, the fifth highest pairs of scores. We shake up in, uh, with, a, with a flip of a coin, one gets the new meth and one gets the old. So when we're done is basically we have two groups that are roughly the same, right? We have one group who has some kids with really high IQs but some kids with low, and the other group has uh, a, a, a bunch of kids with high IQs and a bunch of kids with low, and they're roughly the same. These are called, we now call these uh, uh, s roughly equivalent groups. Here are the scores. You can see that these two kids, you know, were probably sort of moderate IQ, whereas these two kids were probably the two highest IQ t kids. Here's two kids that probably had pretty high, high IQs that were paired. Each one of these scores comes from a separate kid, but remember now we have pairs of scores because we've matched the subjects on the basis of their IQ. These are scores on the Wisconsin Achievement Test. We've calculated the difference between each of these pairs of scores. 78 minus 74 is 4. 55 minus 45 is 10, and so on and so forth. All we need now to compute is the mean difference, the standard deviation of the differences, and the standard error of the differences. We do that pretty simply just uh, in Excel, or you can even, even do this by hand pretty quickly, and we wind up with the standard error of the differences is 2.161. The, the mean difference is 5.4. We put that into our, uh, our formula, and we get a uh, p-value of 0 0.01. Um, the degrees of freedom in the two-sample test, uh, dependent sample test, which is the number of pairs of scores minus 1. So here we would reject the null hypothesis if our p is less than alpha, and it is. And uh, that's how you do a dependent sample t-test.